This morning, I have the privilege of continuing a series that we've been in called Unsung. And in this series, we are taking some time to look at some biblical characters who didn't quite make the superstar list. They, they didn't quite make the highlight reel. They didn't quite make it to history famous status. But what we learned very quickly is though they were not historically famous, in heaven they were applauded. They were famous because for the seasons of time that they had, though not known, though not necessarily lauded by history, that they made the most of the moments they were given to make much of the name of God and heaven leaned over and cheered for them. And in an era of time where we are so obsessed with likes and followers and, and we're so obsessed with, with success and, and significance, what an amazing thing to be reminded that heaven does not evaluate success by lights and stages. It doesn't evaluate success by how many people know us and applaud it and applause us, applaud us and praise us. Heaven evaluates success by how we took the moments we were given and made much of the name of God, whether or not people ever found out about us. And so this morning we are going to meet uh, a pretty impressive character uh, by the name of Jonathan. And um, in this character, we are going to learn so many different things, but I think the thing that will surface the most are lessons in humility. Lessons in humility. And I believe through Jonathan's life, the Lord wants to speak something pretty timely to our church. I believe he wants to speak something pretty timely to the church at large in regards to humility. Um, now, it's not a really well-known secret uh, around here in sporting terms that I am not, by any stretch of the imagination, a fan of Tom Brady. Now, if you don't know who Tom Brady is, just praise the Lord for that. He has spared you from a lot of grief. Um, but for the sake of this conversation, Tom Brady is uh, the quarterback of the New England Patriots um, NFL football um, league. And I, I, I don't like him. I'm sorry. Um, but I feel like this is a safe place. We're among friends so we can share these kinds of things. I don't. But let me also share this confession. that I, It's not that I think Tom Brady is a bad guy. He seems like a nice enough guy. Now, granted, I don't understand why he deflates footballs and cheats. But other than that, he seems like a fairly nice guy. So it's nothing personal, the reasons I dislike him. Um, okay, I dislike him because a, a little while ago, I pledged my allegiance to the single most legendary football player history has ever known, Peyton Manning. And so, uh, therefore, thank you, I knew I was among friends and that the Spirit of God is strong in this place. Um, <laughs> But I am a huge Peyton Manning fan. In fact, I don't watch much football anymore. What's the point? Is it even still football now that Peyton Manning has retired? I don't know. I don't watch much football. Well, let me, let me correct that. I will watch football if I think there's a possibility that Tom Brady and the New England Patriots may get a thorough butt whooping. Then I'll watch football. Go Dolphins. Um, but other than that, I don't watch football very much because Peyton Manning has, has gone. And let me just be honest. I mean, I, this is still... It's juvenile, but I'll share it nonetheless. The reality is my beef isn't really with Tom Brady. My issue is that I have pledged allegiance and I've hitched my wagon to the legendary and the great Peyton Manning. So when some dude shows up and he's staging epic Super Bowl comebacks from like a three-touchdown deficit to win the trophy, I am salty because... The more success and the more significance that Tom Brady has, the less success and the less significance I feel like Peyton Manning has. And I've hitched my wagon to Peyton Manning, so I feel like the more successful Tom Brady is, the less successful I am because I've pledged allegiance to Peyton Manning. So I can't stand Tom Brady succeeding because it's a threat to my success somehow. That's my rationale. So there you have it. Um, all that to say... <laughs> There is something crazy that happens to us. And we become some crazy type of people. Whenever we feel like our success or our significance is threatened. Woo! 
Something happens to us. And before long, it's like, why do you even hate Tom Brady? I don't remember. But something about my success and my significance has been threatened by virtue of the fact that I am for Peyton Manning. Something happens to us. Ooh, and that new cute girl comes to school. And all of a sudden, I used to be the cute one in the boy's eyes, and now they're paying attention to her, and she may be the nicest person on the planet, but ooh, child, I heard she and blah, 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 blah. When his sales start to skyrocket at work, it starts to become a threat to your success and your significance. And he may be the greatest guy on the planet, but you heard he has problems at home, though. She may be the nicest mom on the planet, but when you peep her Instagram account, and you have an Instagram account, and every time you look at her Instagram account, her kid seems so perfect and so well put together, you start to be like, mm, but they look super, anath- uh, you know, non-athletic though, you know? And you just start to throw, something happens to us when we feel like our significance and our success is threatened. But I want to suggest to you that it's in those exact moments when our significance and our success feels threatened that heaven is leaning over to see what comes out of us. Because it's in those moments that heaven headlining humility is revealed or the lack of thereof. And we get to learn some pretty amazing things through the life of Jonathan, someone who knew what it meant to have your significance and your success threatened. We're going to be in 1 Samuel 18 uh, for uh, the majority of our time, but we're going to start at the end of 1 Samuel 17, and we're going to end up in 1 Samuel 19. So if you have a copy of the scriptures and you want to turn to the end of 1 Samuel 17, that will be the perfect place um, to meet us as we get introduced to this character named Jonathan. If you don't have a copy of the Bible, by the way, we will have the verses up here on the screen. And um, if you don't own a Bible, we would love to get one in to your hands. We believe it is the living and breathing word of God and would love um, to have a movement of people who are engaging this word and finding it engaging us. First Samuel, we'll start at the end of verse uh, chapter 17. Um, and we're going to meet a character named Jonathan. Um, and, and a few things about Jonathan before we get to engage him a little bit um, more. Um, Jonathan is a son. Uh, That's one of the first things we learn about Jonathan. Jonathan is a son. Jonathan is the son of King um, Saul, the first king of the nation of Israel. Um, We learn that, that Jonathan is the favorite. He is the favorite Um, He is the oldest son of King Saul, and culturally, that just meant that the guy was the favorite because as the oldest son, he was the heir to King Saul. So he was the guy who was going to carry on the family name of Saul. But more than that, he was the guy who was going to carry on the crown. He was the guy who was going to take over the throne in um, in the nation of Israel. But uh, lucky for Saul, uh, this guy wasn't just, you know, uh, the favorite, the heir, the favorite one. He was a warrior. This guy was a pretty um, impressive human being. In fact, the very first time that we meet Jonathan in in 1 Samuel chapter 13, um, he is on the battlefield um, with his dad, and he's commanding a a crew of about 1,000 men. And with that crew of 1,000 men, he goes into a city in the enemy Philistine nation, and he absolutely obliterates that Um, city. Um, He's not just along for the ride with his dad, you know, because he is his son, but he is a warrior. He is an incredible military mind. And, um, you know, he he does this, by the way, in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 13, when he's about 25 years old, or so. so his dad obviously believes in his son's potential to lead. He believes in his son's potential to be a military warrior. 
Um, but we also learn about uh, Jonathan that this guy is a stud. He is a stud. He is a physical specimen. And the Bible is not ashamed to let us know the fact. Like his dad, this guy was a beast. The Bible calls him swifter than an eagle. Do you know how speedy you have to be? And it calls him as strong as a lion. That's just Hebrew for stud. Not the kind of guy whose skittles you'd ever want to mess with. And then if you put weapons in his hand for Forget about it. He was an expert marksman. It, it describes him in the Bible as being super dangerously precise with the bow and with the sling. The guy will not miss. Just saying, Jonathan, when we get introduced to him, is a stud. So as you can imagine, his legend is growing. His stock is rising, you know, like, like Bitcoin. Stories are spreading about how impressive this guy is. And there are even whispers starting to spread through the kingdom about how we can't wait for Jonathan to take over the throne. This guy is impressive. People are praising him. He has Twitter, Twitter followers, and he has book deals, and, and he's, you know, doing the late night talk show circuit. He is the man, Jonathan, until one day. His significance is threatened. Because if you read the story, one day, out of nowhere, comes a young man named David. Remember him? David shows up, and David kills a giant named Goliath. And by doing that, he rescues the nation of Israel, and he becomes an overnight sensation. He becomes a national hero. Check out what happens at the end of chapter 17, verse 57. It says, as soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, that's Goliath. Abner, who was like the commander of the military forces, took him and brought him before Saul, the king. David was still holding the Philistine's head. <laughs> Whose son are you, young man? Saul asked him. David said, I am the son of your servant, Jesse of Bethlehem. <laughs> yep, you see where this is going, Peyton. See, because you're only a stud until somebody starts to stage a comeback from a multi-touchdown deficit in the Super Bowl. Then your significance starts to get a little bit threatened. I mean, you're only a specimen until a whole new brand of specimen shows up unlike the nation has ever seen. All of a sudden, King Saul is interested. Who are you, young man? Woo! You're an impressive character as Jonathan stands there and watches this go down. I mean, you're only awesome until this... this, this Kid shows up who doesn't need a thousand men to not just take down a city of the Philistines, but to take down the entire nation as a 17-year-old. Your significance might start to get a little threatened because you're awesome until a teenager shows up who's not just theoretically as strong as a lion, but there was one time when he actually chased down a lion, caught that thing, and wrestled a sheep free from its jaws as a freshman in high school. Now he's rolled into town. You better believe threat starts to rise, success and significance starts to feel challenged a little bit, and you put a sling in his hand, forget about it. He may just kill a nine-foot-nine giant with one stone. 
forget might, he actually did it one time. In fact, he's standing with a giant's head in his hand in the presence of King Saul. One minute, Jonathan is the man. Woo! He's successful and he's, he's significant and everybody knows him. His praise is rising and the very next minute, this kid comes to town and threatens all of that. What will happen now? See, because to us, our natural way of thinking as human beings this is a bit of a tense moment. This is a bit of maybe even a tragedy. But to heaven, the stage is set and this is no more than an opportunity. This is an opportunity to see what is going to emerge from Jonathan in the face of a threat to his significance and his success. And let me tell you this, church, right now, every time your significance or your success is threatened, it is an opportunity. And you better believe heaven is leaning over to see what you're made of and to see what will emerge from you. So the angels are now paying attention. And I'm not going to lie, I'm a little curious, too. What's Jonathan going to do? 1 Samuel chapter 18. These two studs finally meet. And I cannot wait to see how this face-off will go. Verse 1. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one with him in spirit and loved him as himself. What? That is so super anticlimactic. That is not going to top the box office. That is a terrible fight, and it only gets worse. From that day, Saul kept him with him, kept David with him, and did not let him return to his family. I believe there are laws for that these days. Um, and Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. So Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. <laughs> this, is so, this is such a terrible fight. This is so bad. Um, and, uh, you know, as I was reading this, I was reminded of one of my coworkers who <laughs> admitted to a few of us on... Um, on the team that if he ever felt like physically in danger, like surrounded and threatened <laughs> and was a little nervous, he already had in his mind what his strategy would be. If he felt threatened, he said he would just start disrobing, just like <laughs> taking articles of clothing off. And the theory is that um, the enemy or the threat would look at him and be like, oh, you're crazy, or just like, you're crazy. Either way, that this strategy would allow the enemy to let this person go. That's hilarious. So anyway, needless to say, we would talk to him with really soft and gentle tones around the office so as not to startle him and put him in a threatened posture, lest he start to, to strip, and they're just not enough counselors in the world. Um, so I don't know, I don't know if uh, this person got the idea from Jonathan, because this is just super weird. Um, oh, you're David. Okay, okay, I see what's going on. And he just starts taking stuff up. This is crazy to me. And I wish I could give you some like, well, in that culture, um, here's what it meant. But no, let's just sit in the weirdness of this PG-13 moment in, in the scriptures. Just starts taking stuff off and handing it to David like he is at gunpoint. So just yeah, try that at work tomorrow. See how it goes. Uh, but, but truly, <laughs> this is one of the most beautiful and extraordinary moments that if you've grown up in the church, you have read past many times. The author starts to explain as we read the story what's going on. And it's in this moment when Jonathan's threat is at its height, 
or at least getting to its height. It takes a new level here in a little bit. But in, in this moment when his significance and his success is threatened, that we start to learn what's in this guy. And we start to learn these beautiful lessons, these beautiful marks of humility. And the first thing we see in Jonathan is recognition. Recognition. And I'm telling you, if we're going to grow in heaven headlining humility, we are going to need to grow in the art and the discipline and the practice of recognition, which is what Jonathan does here. When he sees David for the first time and he hears David talking to his dad, something stirs in Jonathan's spirit and he, he immediately recognizes there is a calling God has placed on your life. He recognizes it immediately. And it says Jonathan becomes one with David in spirit. This is so powerful. And I know the Spirit of God wants to do something in us even as we gaze into Jonathan's response. He became one with him in spirit. And in essence, what the author is telling us is Jonathan meets David, his greatest threat, looks at him, and he recognizes there is a mark of God on your life to do great things for him, and you need to know I am with you, and I am for you, and we are in this thing together. They become one in spirit. I'm like, what? Who does that? Who responds to a threat this way, and yet his humility comes rushing to the surface? God has called you to something, and I believe we are after that same something. The greatness of the name of our God in the earth. And so in this beautiful moment of recognition, what Jonathan sees when he looks at David is not a threat. He sees a teammate. Because we are after the same thing, the greatness of the name of our God. When he looks at David, he's able to see his calling more than he sees his competition. That's Heaven headlining humility. You better believe heaven is leaning over the edge applauding this guy's response to David. God has a calling on you to do great things for him. And I just want you to know I am for you and I am with you. And if that places you a few steps ahead of me in the department of studliness, so be it. I don't care. Let's just get to work together. We are one in spirit and I love you like I love myself, which is an amazing way of saying that Jonathan didn't have spite over this. He gladly embraced this, and heaven is losing its mind. And then the next thing we see is not just his recognition, but we see his resourcing. This is another mark of humility, um, and we'll see how that may potentially play out in our own lives. Jonathan is more impressive than just that. He doesn't just recognize God's calling, he resources David for God's calling. See, because it's one thing for me to say, I see uh, the potential that God has placed in you, and uh, I'm fine with it. Whatever, be Brady. It's another thing altogether to come alongside and say, I am going to resource, do whatever I can Give whatever I can to help you be everything that you've been called to be. And that's what Jonathan does in this beautiful section of Scripture. 1 Samuel 18, um, verse 3 says, And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. He made a commitment to David because he loved him as himself. I'll do whatever I can to help you become all you are called to be. And if there's any doubt whether or not Jonathan meant that, he proves it by the way he resources David. This is so beautiful. Hence the stripping scene in the Bible. 
David is standing with a head in his hand. Forget that. Jonathan comes up to David and, and he takes off his robe and he hands it to David. Do you even understand the beauty of what's happening in that moment? I look at you and I recognize it as a 17-year-old. God is calling you to something significant. And I'll tell you what it is. I believe when I look at you that this royal robe actually belongs to you. I thought all my life, 25 plus years, 27 years, whatever, that I was supposed to take over my father's throne. But the moment I saw you, I knew. The throne belongs to you. So he takes off his royal robe and he gives it to David, resourcing him for what he believes God is calling him to. And then he takes off his tunic, and the tunic signified the kingdom. And he's saying, and I believe God has called you to lead this kingdom, so take this tunic. Oh, and when I saw you, and when I saw what you did, I am convinced that I may be a pretty good warrior, but you are a mighty man of war through whom God is going to do great military exploits. And so take my bow, and take my sword, and take my belt, because he is calling you to do something that I cannot do, at least not as significantly. As you are going to do it. Do you understand the power and the beauty of Jonathan's gesture in this moment? I don't just recognize God's calling on you. I'm willing to give up stuff to resource you so that you can get to where you need to go. Because where you need to go is where I want to see us all go for the sake of the kingdom and for the sake of our great king God. I'll resource you. Heaven is losing its mind. Who does that? Who gives up playing time so somebody else can get playing time because it's really about the team anyway? Who does that? Who says, I'll give you some of my clients so you can get further because I can see in you God's gifted you to be a salesperson better than I can be. And that's better for this company. And so, hey, take it. Let's go. We're after the same thing. One in spirit. This is such a powerful moment that I've read over. Time. And time again. The question is, is that what threat brings out of you? Is this a description of you? Because you have moments day after day. And you're going to have plenty of moments this week in the most competitive week of all. Whose Christmas card is the cutest, and, and, you know, and whose gifts are better than whose gifts. We are all going to have opportunity to respond to what feels like my significance and my success is threatened. Does this describe you? Are you able to look at people and by the grace of God, able to see the marks of God on them? Are you able to look at people beyond the threat to what God may be calling them to? And I believe the Spirit of God wants to do something in our time and in his people that allow us to be able to recognize in each other. Ooh, God has placed something in you. And if that thing in you starts to thrive, I am for you so that we can all together get to the place where we are called to go. Are you able to sense God's calling or gifting and the very people and the things that might threaten your sense of significance? In fact, I want to suggest to you that the people who may be the most threatening to you and your success and significance may often be the people who God wants you to see his mark in. But instead of seeing his mark, I start to see my own lessening, and I can't handle that. Are you able to, to, to recognize in people what God may be doing? Even with a person who maybe gets more playing time than you, or who sells more product than you, or has more of the boys' attention at school than you, or more followers on social media than you. Is this you? Are you, by the way, the parent? 
who parents like this, who your kids are not a threat to you. And I don't mean like, oh, they're a threat, they're scaring me, but a threat in that, you know, will they grow up to be what I want them to be? Or is there the threat that they may disappoint me and they may live far from me? And so I've got to raise my kids to need me. Are you going to raise your kids to need you or to exceed you? Do you recognize that, no, no, God has put a mark on them. And if what he's calling them to do takes them away from us or gets them to go further than we ever went, we are so with them and we are so for them and we're going to resource them to be everything he's called them to be. Otherwise, I'm going to be threatened. I'm going to cling on to them and I'm going to protect them and I'm going to try and hide them and keep them for me instead of releasing them for his kingdom. Am I, as a pastor, willing to celebrate the growth of another church as everybody talks about how awesome they are and how awesome they are, and I start to feel threatened, like the significance of Mission Point is threatened by the success of that other church, or am I willing to look at the mark of the Spirit in that church and celebrate the fact that we are all after the 50,000 who are lost in our county and we want to see them come home? There's such power in Jonathan's recognition and his willingness to resource. And if we can send some of our people to go to your church to help you with what you're doing so together we can get to where we need to go, one in spirit. Evan is impressed with eyes that can recognize the mark of God where everyone else may only see the threat of glory loss. And my life, by the way, has been changed by people like Jonathan, who saw in me long before I saw in myself the ways God may have marked me, and they spoke over me, and they, they resourced me. And I had friends in college who weren't threatened, and we weren't necessarily threatened by each other. We, we worked together, um, and, and that's led to things I never expected that I would do. Like I, in high school, would borderline throw up every time I had to give a speech in class. And now I, I talk for part of my job. Now, let me be honest, since this is a safe place, I still borderline throw up every time I have to step on stage. My wife knows that. Some of my team know that. It's still a terrifying thing. But because there were people who said, but we see the calling, and we want to do what we can to, to resource. And I want to be that kind of Jonathan-esque guy. Who, what does it look like? to recognize and to resource because in humility I realize it's bigger than me and it's about something greater than me. So you'd think God would honor Jonathan in such a way that the threat would subside, but it actually intensifies. And you see hints of that in verse 2 here in 1 Samuel 18. Look at what it says. It says, from that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. So in this abduction scene um, <laughs> that we see, um, Saul becomes so enamored with David that he uses his royal influence to move David into his palace and to make David a part of his family. Not only that, uh, but David quickly becomes the primary focus of Saul's attention. Now, why do I tell you that? Because I read this and I feel like anxiety for Jonathan. Because it's one thing to lose the adoration of a nation. It's another thing to lose the affection of your father to this 17-year-old kid. I mean, I gave you my robe. I gave you the throne. You've taken the headlines. Okay. But now you've moved into my home and you've taken my father's Affection. Jonathan, remember when you used to be your dad's favorite kid? Remember that? Remember when that look of hope and, and promise and, and, you know, joy and, and anticipation was directed your way? Remember when he used to believe in you 
like that? Dude, you've been totally replaced. There's a new favorite son in the house. That was Jonathan's reality. And it didn't stop. Verse 5. It says, whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful. There's that word. What does the success of others do to you? David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. Hey, Jonathan, remember when you used to be the man? Remember when you were the warrior to be reckoned with? I mean, do you remember that? Do you, do you remember when, when your dad would let you lead a portion of his army into war? Now David uh, does. And, oh, he's 10 years younger than you, and he now pulls rank on you in the army. How painful would this season of life have been for Jonathan? Talk about rejection. Talk about threat. And the headlines are gone. The throne is gone. The praise and applause is gone. And now your dad is gone. Pretty much everything that would have meant everything to, to a Hebrew son of royal blood seemed to be taken away because this kid came to town. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of curious to know if Jonathan would stick to his, like, hey, we are brothers and we're in this thing together now. Because he's lost a little more than he had a few years ago. Is he going to recognize the calling still? And is he going to resource for the sake of the kingdom still. Well, he'll have an opportunity to find out soon enough because Saul quickly discovers that this kid David is not just more impressive in human eyes than his son, but he's become more impressive than him. All the rage is about David this, David that. David has slain his 10,000s. And oh yeah, Saul a couple of thousand. But David mainly has slain his ten thousands, and Saul is triggered by the threat. And his response is unlike David's response to the threat. In his mind, threats are competitors who need to be eliminated. So he puts a head out on David. And guess who he asks to carry it out? Jonathan! Hey, I need you to kill David. Now, I'm reading this story, and I'm like, okay, now the movie got interesting again, because that whole scene over there, that was not really action-packed. Now, I'm, I'm interested um, again, because, I mean, how much more could God's provision be cleared to Jonathan? I mean, God has handed him this opportunity on a silver platter to eliminate his threat. I mean, it's not like Jonathan really wanted to kill David, but you know, I mean, he has to follow orders. I mean, sorry, David, it's not what I want, but my dad, or what kind of soldier would I be if I didn't follow orders? This is amazing. God has given Jonathan an opportunity. I'm back, son. I am the favorite son again, because now my dad hates David. Yes. I'm back on the throne, man, and I'm back in the headlines, and I'm back. All I need to do is eliminate this threat. Chapter 19, verse 1. Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. But Jonathan had taken a liking to David. I'm like, that was years ago. Still? That was before he moved into your room. And he warned David, hey, my father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding 
and stay there. What? Boring for action. Heaven is loving the show. I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are, and I'll speak to him about you and will tell you what I find out. And in this beautiful scene, we see Jonathan's humility step in and play a protector role in David's life. He is a protector to the threat because he believes he's not really a threat. He's a teammate. You don't protect threats. You protect teammates. I, I, I love this. Even though David is enjoying everything Jonathan would have loved to have back, he sticks to his commitment. One in spirit. We are in this thing together. And I will resource you to the point of protecting you from any threat to you, even though you should be a threat to me. He chose to protect David and to protect his calling. And by the way, I love the fact that Jonathan is in heaven now realizing, like, oh, my goodness. Hey, so anyway, uh, hey, guys, angels, hey, remember how I protected the Messiah's line um, back then? He had no idea what he was doing. But he was protecting a guy who he believed he saw the mark of God on, and he believed it was good for God and his kingdom. Getting rid of you, David, might be great for me, but not for God's mission. So Jonathan warns David of the danger, and he promises to fight for David in the presence of his father. Now I'm skeptical. I'm like, come on. You're going to go talk to your dad, and you're telling me you're going to put in a good word for David? And try. I've got to see this because I don't buy it. I don't know many people who do that kind of thing when someone is a threat to them. Verse 4, Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul. What? How do you even find anything nice to say? And you notice, he doesn't say anything personal about David. But he spoke to his, to his father and said to him, Let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you. And what he has done has benefited you greatly. You are where you are in part because of what he did. He killed the giant. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord, and you start to see where Jonathan's attention is focused, not on the headlines, not on everybody else's opinion, but on the Lord and on his kingdom and on his agenda. He says, the Lord won a great victory for all of Israel. And you saw it, and you were glad. Have you forgotten that? Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? And he doesn't just protect him. He becomes a defender to David. That's amazing. Do you know how rare it is for someone to not only pass on an opportunity to speak ill of a threat, but to go so far as to defend the threat against any threat against him. This is so rare, so beautiful, such beautiful marks of humility. It is not about me. It is about something bigger than me. And I'm willing to defend you for the sake of that thing. This is really difficult because if everyone else thinks she's amazing and they're just always going on and on about how amazing she is this and she's amazing that, it is hard enough to jump in and to pile on more praise and to be like, oh, you don't even know the half of it. She is more awesome than that. That's hard enough, let alone to pass on an opportunity when people start to throw shade and people start to say stuff and you don't just sit silently. You defend the honor. You defend what you recognize. You defend for the sake of the greater work of God. Jonathan reminds his dad, God's calling on David's life benefits this kingdom and benefits his name. Do not, do not go after him for no good reason. And in that season, Jonathan actually manages to save David's life, and it would cost him, because eventually, 
Jonathan was so protective and so defensive of David that his dad said, you have clearly chosen his side. You have clearly chosen the side of my enemy. And the two of you have formed an alliance. And because of that, he turned his attention towards Jonathan as well. And on one occasion, he picks up a spear to try and kill his own son because of his association to the threat. But Jonathan would still choose to protect and defend David because of what he recognized God was doing in him and for the sake of the great name of God. And I'm just asking, are you that? person. Is that what threat to your success or your significance brings out of you? Are you a protector of the person who you should be or maybe are a little bit threatened by? Because you realize or recognize, yeah, but God is doing something and whatever is happening in me is not as important as what God is doing in them. And whatever I'm feeling is not as important as what God is doing for his namesake and for the sake of his kingdom. Are you that person, the kind of person who may never be known on earth but heaven is leaning over and applauding you because you insist on seeing what God is doing and you insist on what God is about. And you insist on not just sitting quietly, anyone can sit quietly, but you insist on even defending your brother or your sister or your teammate or your coworker because you realize this is bigger than me, this is about the company or this is about the, te the team. And most importantly, this is about the kingdom of God and the work he's doing in and through his church. I, I believe, even as I've looked at this, I believe Jesus is doing something in these days in which he is pouring out his spirit to unite his church to finish out his mission. And if that's going to happen, there's going to need to be a wave of Jonathan-like, heaven-headline-making humility in and among God's people. There's going to need to be a movement of humility that brings about unity. Because you know as well as I do, if you read the Bible, it says the world is going to be compelled that Jesus is who he says he is. Not because the church is threatened by each other, not because the church is competing with each other, but because the church is one in spirit saying we're after the same mission, we're after the same agenda. We want to see the name of our God made great. We want to see 50,000 people in our county brought to life in him. And so if that puts you a little bit ahead of me in the headlines and what people say, so be it. We are together in this for the name of our God. And what the Bible says is when the world sees that, not competitiveness and not bickering and not which mom is cooler than which mom, but we are a team moving together, there will be an awakening in our time. And I believe Jonathan is speaking something to us and what the Spirit of God may want to invite us to be about as a church, to be about as a people. And the enemy would love nothing more than to whisper in our ears, remember when you used to be the, huh? see how crazy your kids are at home? Look at her perfect Instagram kids. Huh? She's your enemy. You should throw some shade and see how much playing time they get. Oh, that, and he will use any excuse. And before you know it, we are threatened by the people at work that we are being called to share the gospel with. And I'm not telling them about hope. I'm threatened by how they're taking away my significance. And it becomes this ploy in the enemy's hands to erode what Jesus is trying to do in and through his people. And what I'm telling you is it's when threat emerges that you know the Spirit of God is giving us an opportunity to cultivate humility in us.
You don't know how humble you are until your significance and your success is threatened. And what do you do then? Do you, no, 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 I'm going to compete because my job is to beat you or to beat you out? Or does it bring out of you there is something so much bigger than me at stake here? And I want to even resource however I can to help towards that end. And I believe the Spirit of God is calling a movement of Jonathan's in our church. And one of the reasons I'm convinced of this is because one of the reasons we love Jonathan is because like every hero in the Bible, he reminds us of our Savior, Jesus. When I look at Jonathan's story, you know the image that comes to my mind? It's the image of Jesus Christ standing, hanging on the cross. It's the picture of Jesus weakened on the cross. Why? So that he could give us his strength. So that he could give us his armor. It's the picture of Jesus stripped bare on the cross. Why? So he could take his robe of righteousness and wrap it around us. It's a picture of Jesus on the cross stripped bare because the tunic of his kingdom has been given to us so that all of a sudden those of us who are threats to him can share in his inheritance and we've become parts of ruling in his kingdom. It's this powerful picture of Jesus defenseless. Why? Because he's taken his weapons and he's given them to us. Here, take my sword, the sword of the spirit with which you will do great exploits in the world. It's a picture of Jesus who on the cross is accepting the fact that because I have associated and I've become one with these people, there's now been a spear that has stabbed me in my side because I've insisted on defending the sinner and I've insisted on protecting them against the wrath of my father. It's this picture of Jesus Christ who is saying, man, I used to have a room all to myself up in heaven as the favorite son. But now I'm willing to share my room and my palace and my space with all of you. Come on in. Because it's not about me. It's not about myself. It is about the glory of the Father. And I'm willing to bring about a whole bunch of brothers and sisters. And even though some people know Francis Chan more than they know Jesus, I'm okay. Let's move forward. There is such a powerful picture of Jesus in Jonathan. And I believe that as we start to take steps in humility and we say, it's not about me, it's about the kingdom and the glory of our God, the world will start to see a picture of Jesus in the church and they'll be drawn to him in these beautiful and compelling ways. But it starts with a humility that recognizes what God might be doing in this situation. And resources, I'll do whatever I can to come alongside you, even if that pushes you a little bit further than I am. And I will defend you because we are one. And I will protect you because we are one. And nobody may ever have heard about me, but heaven is leaning over the rails, looking at Mission Point, and applauding like crazy for the name of our God is being made great. And so, Lord, I pray that this week, as we have opportunities and as we feel threat, that we would read that as an opportunity to beg your spirit to cultivate humility in us. What might that threat represent? How may that be a mark of something you may be doing? And how can we be those who are the loudest cheerleaders? And Lord, especially in the church, I pray that you would unite us and you would stir in us a humility that longs to see your name made great, regardless of what that does to each of us as individuals. And may we see an awakening in our day. May we see an awakening among the 50,000 in our county who don't have a meaningful connection with you. So work in us. And may our families be refreshed. May our workplaces be refreshed this week as we step in, maybe with just a little more humility. Unite us as a church, not just here at Mission Point, but with a church here in our county, here in our nation, so that together we'll do mighty exploits for your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.